Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever we find you in the world. It is time to get going on resiliency. I know we had some back and forth in the Mentimeter program. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but just really quickly to orient you to what we're doing here today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about how do we recover faster, recharge and build some skills to navigate stress, not only for ourselves, but also for our team members. My name is Matt White. I'm one of the founding partners of the Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute. What you're seeing today is a portion of our virtual classroom. So we're constantly running these type of events for organizations and individuals around the world. And I'll give you more information about that later on if you'd like that. Uh, but we need to get into some content here today. Hey, some quick Zoom basics. You're probably all champs at this, but I'm just going to orient you real fast to it. One, if you can turn on video, I think you're going to learn a lot from your other colleagues that are on this call today. We had about 600 and something registered. We expect to see somewhere between 350 and 400 uh, that remember they registered and show up for this. All right, you can rename yourself if you'd like. It's the three dots in the top right-hand side of your frame, your video frame. And under the right hand, up the upper right-hand corner of Zoom, you can select either gallery view and resize to see a bunch of people, or if you wanna just click speaker view, you'll just view the person that is speaking. This is in a meeting format. We'll do some breakout rooms. You'll be able to unmute yourself if you'd like. You can come on video and chat about this. When you do send chat, we really appreciate you sending it constantly to everyone so that we see what you're saying and everyone else sees it as well. And I've got a couple of just outstanding members backstage from the Chapman & Co team. One is Jamie Dixon. The other one is our managing partner, Sarah Hanna. So they're gonna be helping out today triaging any questions you might have. And please, I know I'm speaking fast. We have a lot of content to get through. Any questions you have, put them in the chat. If we don't have time to answer them today or right now in the session, we'll, we'll make sure that we follow up afterwards. We're a consultancy, we work with leaders uh, to build high-performing cultures, people and pur purpose and process at the center of this success. This is the end of the sales pitch. You didn't sign up to hear me talk about our consultancy, you have signed up to hear us talk about the content. You can see the kind of work we do if you're interested. Afterwards, you can talk to us and we'll be able to do that. I do want to orient you to one place on our website, not because there's anything to sell or any kind of gated content to grab yourself and put you into our CRM. This is just to give you something to use. So if you go to ccoleadership.com slash resources, we have a ton of stuff there available for you. Everything from inclusion type of stuff to COVID-19, communication templates, insights, case studies, documentaries, videos, all kinds of great stuff for you to use with your team. It's all free. Please grab it and use it as you see fit. For those of you that don't know us, Barry Waymiller is our parent company. We're not just a consultancy. We're born within this organization. We're a blend of about 115 acquired companies around the world. The kind of stuff I'm going to be talking to you about, my background is more in the military, but it's also used within Barry Waymiller. We're over 12,000 people around the world. You can see our share price index growth. I wanted to share that with you because I don't want you to think this is just without an outcome. It actually builds a better business as well. As mentioned, we're about 200 locations around the world. Our book that we wrote, our CEO, Bob Chapman, and Raj Sisodia wrote this, Everybody Matters. You can see one of the quotes there. If you're interested, we can uh, get you that book as well. It's kind of a how-to of how Barry Waymiller did this work. I wanted to bring it up though so you understand we are actually practitioners that use this. As I mentioned, my background, over 20 years in the US military, I worked for a lot of foreign militaries, NGOs, the United Nations, NATO. Sometimes a story or an anecdote I'm gonna give you might be in the military sense. I'm not trying to talk about its military resilience. Uh, military people are not genetically different from other humans. I'm telling you the story because it's more in my background and I recognize these are people that were trying to accomplish a mission under a lot of stress. And so if I reference something like my deployment into West Africa, that's the only reason. If you're trying to in your mind think, well, how does this work in the civilian world? Let me know that in chat that I've missed the ability to convey that correctly. So just starting out with respect there that some of the anecdotes might be that, but it's more than just obviously the military. This is about people serving people. Um, I do wanna mention just really quick here. I do wanna mention all the slides, the polling results, a recording of this session. We're gonna email that to every single person that's on this. Um, there's nothing, there's no limitations so you can share with whoever you would like. Use the slides however you would like, get it out there. It's good content. I'm judging my own work right now. It's good content and we want you to use it into the world. So don't worry about that kind of stuff. 
We also run these sessions uh, in organizations. So if you'd like us to run this session with your team and your organization, just email us, chat with us, and uh, we'll chat with you later about how we can make that happen. We will be sharing my email and ways to get in contact with us afterwards. All right, um, to start us off as well, I know that you come here for just this idea about resiliency. And we're gonna work through a little bit about what are the best practices you already do, what are already out there. We'll talk a little bit about the environment, then we'll go through how we build it individual, through change, and also in our teams. And lastly, we'll finish up with some action items. I put this picture in here about Sisyphus. He's the one who was condemned in the afterworld by Zeus to constantly push a boulder up a hill. And right as it crested the hill and the boulder was going to roll down the other side, it rolls back. And as in punishment has to go back down and grab the rock. And I know that sometimes that's how we feel, especially in our current environment of pushing this up. How do we change our mental state to where it doesn't actually feel like that? And especially during the holidays, right? And I thought about, well, what do people do when they lose their resiliency, right? And I thought that this quick video, there's no sound to it, but this quick video of this girl just deciding to tee off on the Santa who has a shocked look on its face. And I like that she's like, we're not done, Santa. Pick Santa up and still gives him some uppercuts. So, and I believe the parents are encouraging this. So there you go. That's what we want to avoid, especially as the holidays come up. One of the ways that I'm gonna be able to interact with you, let me just put a couple of people on mute here real fast. One of the ways that we're gonna be able to interact with you is through Mentimeter. And I apologize if there was some confusion in the beginning here. I'd like you to open up another browser, either on your smartphone or on your computer. Just go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And I'm gonna bring us over into that platform. This is a question we asked in the beginning. The code is 77, 9952.3, and we're going to put that in chat as well. I think I might have messed that up, so I apologize for anyone who was trying to put in a code that uh, was not correct. The number in the bottom right there is the number of people who have put an input in. The more folks we have on this system, this platform, uh, the better the information will be that I'm going to give you back. And we're going to download this and provide it to all the attendees as well. Uh, in addition, what we asked this question for in the beginning was um, the really cool thing about asking about what music or bands did you listen to while growing up, it's the way you can hack into your own self. So the reason I asked this question is if you want to put yourself into a good mood, if you will, resilience, if I want to put myself into a good mood, I'd listen to the music I grew up listening to. Um, it's formative, you remember the time, whatever that is, and you'll see a lot of people put in, the larger the word, the more people put that band or group in. In this case, I think U2 is winning out, followed closely by NSYNC, good on you all, which is a good time for me to bring up the fact that everything you put into Menti is 100% anonymous and confidential. There's no way I can find out what was said, how did that all work. So if you put in a boy band, that's on you. We will never know who that was, Jamie. All right, here we go. That's the first question. Let's get into more questions that are a little bit more on topic here. All right, what words right now, before we get into the content, just sourcing from you all, what words do you associate with resilience? And I'll take anything, right? Not good, bad, indifferent. We turned on the profanity filters, so you can put anything you want here. Persistence, um, stamina, bouncing back, good. Strength, uh, grit, that's a great one. Flexibility, fortitude, tough and toughness. I expected to see that one. That's great. Stick to itness. I know it's not a word, but we're using it as one and I love it. Challenging, persistence, determination, overcoming. Smooth transition. That's interesting. Good one. Not giving up. Recovery. Yeah, level, almost like level headed or calm in the face of the storm. These are all great. And I like the person who put in badass. I don't know why our profanity filter did not catch that, but good on you, my friends. Yes, armor as well, good one. Blasting, stand up, journeyman, durable, all great ones. But do you notice a lot of them are all about um, how I can withstand something? And I know there's some in here that were kind of like adaptability, but a lot of it was almost like, I am going to stand strong in the face of something opposing me. We're gonna give you some little bit of different framing as we move into this. Some more questions for you all, just before we get into the content. What do you do right now to increase your own personal resilience? What's a behavior? What's something that you might do to increase your own personal resilience? And again, I'll take any of these. I exercise, I pray, 
Um, I work out, I stay calm, I brush it off. I just, I don't let it get to me. Self affirmations, good. Yoga, breathing. I like this one, I clean off my desk or I clean out my desk, good. Like I just clean the area around me. I don't make it look so cluttered. Um, I find routines. I like whoever just put in, I just keep swimming. Swimming. Thank you, Dora from Finding Nemo. Yeah, I just keep swimming. I take a walk. And there's gonna be a reference about swimming in here. So that's really good you brought it up. I do golf, I work out, I do things for others. That's a great one, I serve, good. Go outside, take a walk, I'm with nature, I meditate. All these really great. All right, let me transition then and ask the same question, but this time about what do you do to increase your team's resilience? And as I mentioned, as you're putting these in, we'll download this, we'll provide it all to you in an email so you have some other ideas from other people, like what do you do individually? And now as you see us building this, what are we doing as a group? Yeah, and we'll pick it up. Do you have a problem with this in Mentimeter? Uh, either Jamie or Sarah will pick it up out of chat and put it into Menti for you. What do we do to increase our team's resilience? I listen. I'd love to see that one coming up. I encourage. I pray. Sure, we'll talk about a little bit of recognition. I do a check-in. Empathy, we're going to hit. Great one. Encouragement, I talk to them. Um, I connect on a personal level. There's some confirmation. Give them some time off. Good. Fun activities. All these are great stuff to do. All right, I'm gonna bring us back into some of the content as we get going here. But I appreciate you putting that in because that's all correct. And we're actually not gonna focus in on that. I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a, a yogi. I'm not, I mean, I practice it, I'll do it sometimes, but I, I'm not gonna start in with a yoga class. That's Jesse on our team for Movement Mondays, which I rarely participate in. All of these things are correct. They're all great to do. It's just, that's the base level. Do a hobby, get better sleep, eat really good meditate. If you're a person of faith, you pray. Um, perhaps there's a time that you're reading books, you clean off your desk. All of these things are great to do. We kind of look at these as table stakes. And if I were to focus there, I don't know that I'm giving you, or we don't know that we're giving you anything additive into the conversation about resiliency. So this is going to focus a little bit on, yes, doing that. And then what am I going to build that on? So eat your veggies, and we're going to talk about some other stuff. We always like to define the basic terms sometimes so that as we associated a lot of words with resiliency, I think you'll see these two definitions encapsulate what you mentioned. I love this picture of the tree where it got washed down underneath it and it said, well, that's fine. I'm just going to grab on to the sides. Resiliency, notice the definitions here. It's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It isn't not to, not to acknowledge or not to have those difficulties happen. It's the capacity to recover. I'm not going to go into how do we do micro recoveries and all of that stuff, but even when we see somebody who seems to have incredible resilience, what they're doing is cycling this really fast. I'm recovering quickly from difficulties. In other words, it it's, appears to be very tough. It's also the ability of a substance or object, this is a literal definition, to spring back into shape. In other words, elasticity. I know there's a Chinese proverb about bamboo and how it bends with the wind and all that kind of stuff, but that's basically what we're talking about here is a little bit about the elasticity. Resilience then therefore is not necessarily about how I simply endure, it's about how I recharge and how I return. Uh, one of my favorite activities, I don't do a lot of it since I'm in St. Louis, but this is my hometown of San Clemente, California and a great shot of the pier at sunset and a surfer. So uh, perhaps loving the ocean is one way that we come back to this. Let's chat a little bit about the environment, the environment we're in right now and perhaps as we look into the near future, it's a one filled with uncertainty. I don't know what's gonna happen. Anxiety, I'm anxious about it. In other words, I'm worried, I devote thought to it, and perhaps even fear. Some of these questions you'll see there, the health concerns, the business pressures. How do we reinvent ourselves? How do we reinvent the business? The holidays are coming up. My gosh, what a terrible time for them. Again, at the end of the year, the holidays. And the one that we hear a lot from our clients right now, because we've had either we've let some people go or we've had to reorganize the question, how am I supposed to do more with less? You want me to still serve our current customer, client base, whatever it might be, and I have less resources or people or money to do it with. Um, and so in the military saying would be, we've ran out of money, we now need to think. That would be the equivalency of our environment here today. Why is this important? Because as I put people under stress, especially undue stress where it's constant, it's not just quick, there's a project, it's the environment 
I burn energy faster, but most importantly, I start to shift energy away from the prefrontal cortex. Nice word that it makes us sound smart, but it's basically the part of the mind in the front that juggles the complex tasks and planning. This is important to note because this is what it makes more challenging. It makes creativity more challenging, people problem solving, rational decision making, and of course, interpretation of the data. This is why the current environment holds us, especially as leaders, to being more resilient ourselves and giving that resiliency to others. Throughout this, I'm going to ask you some reflection questions. We have this picture of this antique microscope, and I love the idea of the metaphor of this. And for those of you who were in biology class, like in high school or primary, when you used to take the two slices of glass and put something between them, an old drop of water, and you put the two pieces of glass together and slide them other. And when you first looked at it and you brought it into focus, and it was like, I never saw all of those things that were making up that part. And that's what I think about with some of the reflection questions. The reflection questions I'm going to start you off with right now are, what are the situations that challenge your, your resilience and your team's resilience? Do you know those? In other words, what's the self-awareness part of it? And if you don't know what they are, you can always ask your team members or your colleagues, like one question would be, how am I not showing up in the best version of myself? And then I can deduce back. For example, I know that I don't show up or what challenges my resilience the most individually is when there are personal disagreements within the workplace. Like that takes a lot of energy out of me. And then I know my resilience starts to take a hit. Um, our team's resilience when we have to have harder conversations would be an example. And then I want you to just thank you some quick notes to yourself. Well, what are the most effective ways that you and your team already recharge? This, remember, this is meant to be a little additive. You'll see these reflection questions from time to time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time pausing with dead air space here, but I'm giving them to you so afterwards when we send you the slides, you can use this as a group discussion, almost like how you facilitate your team through this. So everything we're doing, I want you to be able to use with your team. Let's jump into a little bit of how we increase our resilience individually. There are four main areas here, and I'm gonna start with the first one. And the first one is positive intent. Positive intent, I love this idea. Positive intent means I'm just going to start. It's the way that I start my mindset. All right, so I have a quote here by Marcus Aurelius talking about the happiness. The happiness of my life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. With all that's going on, can we at least start from the mindset that perhaps, perhaps decisions are not made to make things worse? There actually isn't conspiracy. People are fair, good, honest, competent, and really honestly trying to do their best. Everyone is learning, and the more information you get, the more decisions make sense. I'm not saying that any of these things are not true, but positive intent, having positive emotions within us, starts with, do I begin here before I end up thinking all of these things? Um, as an example, I worked around the world and there were times that I could not understand decisions that were being made by higher headquarters, by corporate, but the more information I got on how those decisions were made, the more I understood the complexity of how the decision was made and the more I understood it. And oftentimes it would reflect back and thinking about how um, I did not show up as the best version of myself when I thought that it was against me or against the group I was leading. So positive intent's a really powerful way. And I know that somebody asked us like basically what, what, what is also not being said in some of these things? What should we be talking about that we're not? Getting that kind of on the table here. One thing that resilient people do individually is they face down the reality. In other words, they focus on what they can control and influence versus what they can't. So they're perfectly fine to face the reality. Look, I think we're on the boat that hit the iceberg. It seems like it's going down. The boat name starts with a T and rhymes with iconic. Okay, the reality is we have to get off of this boat. The reality is we have to make some changes. Resilient people kind of face that but then they focus on, all right, what can I control? What's purely in my control? And I would offer that starts with probably things like my own behavior and how I react to the behaviors of others. Very few things are purely in my control. A whole bunch is in my influence. The relationships I might have, how I interact with, example, union employees or union stewards, all of those things are in my influence. Another way to say this, and I wanna bring up, this is a military example. Um, and it comes from a person named Admiral James Stockdale. 
he was, was one of the few people that spent multiple years. Let me say this again. He was one of the longest standing people besides John McCain, who was in prison. In this case, it was in Vietnam. And they were asking him, who were the people that really survived? Who had the strongest resilience? The thinking of academics was at the time when they were doing this research was it was about the people who were optimistic. And I know some of us use that term like we're a perpetual optimist. Actually, that doesn't equal resilience. What they found and they looked at this and studied the Stockdale paradox and what Stockdale reported was the people who were very much at home with, they were very confident they would be returned home. At the same time, they were confronting all the brutal facts of the current reality. And the current reality was, we might not get out of here by Christmas. We might not leave here by, by Easter because they were, a lot of the optimists were saying, we're gonna be out so soon, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be okay. And the Stockdale paradox said, I have to retain faith that we're gonna make it, but I also need to call out what the brutal facts are of our current, our current reality. As an example, at Chapman & Co., um, when COVID first hit our business, we were in the business of putting a large number of people into rooms and bringing them through really impactful events, sometimes with senior leadership teams, sometimes with large numbers of people in an organization. The brutal fact was that business is gone. Do I know when it's coming back? No. Are we projecting when it comes back? No. That's the brutal reality. We need to confront those facts. At the same time, we're retaining faith that we can come together and find ways to get us out of this. And actually, this is one of the reasons we're having this chat with all of you. And no other time in our previous business model would we be doing this with 300 and something people chatting about resiliency. That's a good example, but it's not that optimism equals resilience. It's that I can understand what the brutal facts are and still say, and I think we're gonna make it through. Here's how. So some reflection questions again. Where can you benefit from using positive intent? What are the brutal facts of your current condition? And I use that term, I know it's a little bit strong language directly from the Stockdale paradox. I think it's trying to get us into um, what some gentleman put in the chat and that was, can we say the things that aren't being said, but that people are thinking? And then of course, what possibilities does the current circumstance present? As mentioned, you can go ahead and take pictures of the slides. We're gonna send them all to you afterwards. The other part about individual is the search for meaning. It's the propensity to make meaning of difficult times. Um, I wanna find meaning of why we're doing this and find ways to use our talents in the current environment. And I know someone had put in, how do you increase your own personal resiliency? You find ways to serve that as a huge one. Um, without it, it seems a little bit lost. Like, what am I doing? What's my, why am I here? What's happening? Um, I'm centering my conversations and decision-making around communication, around purpose and values. Because oftentimes those get right back into, what do I hold dear? What's important to me in life? are huge ones. And I know we had some quotes from Mandela. This would be another one. Viktor Frankl um, served in the Nazi death camp, survived and wrote a really like a seminal work on resiliency, and it would be man's search for meaning. And I see there is some commentary in, uh, in the chat about, is it about a higher purpose or a higher meaning? Yes, absolutely. For some people, it is linked to a faith, a belief in a higher power in God or disciples. For others, it's just service to another person. I mean, Viktor Frankl kind of was like this about how we're challenged to change ourselves. Highly recommended, highly recommended on that one. The other way, especially from an individual is ritualize ingenuity. I know it's a fancy way to say basically, how do you repurpose some stuff? The ability to make do with whatever is at hand. I'm repurposing what I already currently do or have. This is content we would usually deliver in an in-person experience over a much longer time that we're now doing virtually. We remix our core components of business to deliver a new service. Um, in our case, we actually teach people how to run highly engaged virtual events, why you saw Mentimeter, why you're gonna see some videos, why I'm about to put you into a breakout, all of these things are those reasons why. And then what do we do? What are we really good at? And we can deliver it in a new way. For us, we research and write, we think, uh, and I think a lot of our reviews would say this, good content. The two examples I'm giving you here are yoga classes that now are in person in people's home virtually. And then of course, all of us are probably ordering a lot of food from restaurants and doing curbside pickup from retailers. The reason for this is not just, the reason for this is not just to simply find new ways to serve your business. What fights against individual resiliency is idle time. 
And so from a military side, if I'm on deployment, I'm immediately making sure the people that I'm responsible to, those in my span of care, they have something to do. I don't care if we're building plywood huts or we're surveying certain things, we are going to have something to do. And I'm gonna link it back to what we're doing right now. From a business standpoint, when we first went into COVID and work from home as our business back in April, the first thing we did was we reviewed all the things we were going to write on and started writing on them. We didn't know what tomorrow was going to hold or a month. And yes, we did have to pivot. But at the time, one of the most important things were, how do we take what we do well and get people working on it? Because the idle time fights against my ability to be more resilient. I start thinking about more, we're not doing anything. Is my job in jeopardy? How is the business? When is it going to come back? I'm going to forget about that. I'm going to move people more toward action about what we're really good at. And if we all want a little bit of hope here about ritualized ingenuity, proof the human race is going to be okay, a squeezable ketchup bottle. I have two young boys. They have no idea how to get ketchup out of a bottle. Remember all the tricks and tips? I know maybe I'm speaking to only a portion of my audience right now, but there was all of the, like you put a knife into it, you tap it on its side, you hit the bottom of it. Like, I realize my young boy is going to grow up without problem solving skills. Thanks to you, Heinz. But this is good idea about ritualized ingenuity, about how we are going to all be okay. So some reflection questions we'd ask you. Uh, one is, what's the current environment teach you about how to survive the next disturbance? In other words, what am I learning the times when it's pretty tough that I can use for when it's tough again? Um, what ways can I use my talents now to more fully serve? today and tomorrow, and then what can be repurposed to meet the current conditions. Um, a lot of our content is multi-day experiences. We've chunked that into modules, and so you're seeing one of these modules as an example of this. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I know I just have been lecturing at you for about 20 minutes. That's way too long. I appreciate all the commentary and chat. And so at this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build some breakout rooms really quickly for us. And I'm gonna do this by putting probably about, oh, about five or six of us in each one of the rooms. And then I'm gonna have you have a chat because I realize part of the learning is not just what I say, part of the learning is what you can learn um, from one another. Now I understand some of you are like, I do not like breakout rooms. Even if I tell you, no, 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 you could be in there with a person from like, I don't know, you could be in there from a person from South Africa because we have an office there. They're incredible people and you'll learn from them or someone over in Europe or someone from an entirely different organization and industry that you are in. All that said, if you don't like your breakout room or you don't want to be in there, just exit out, rejoin the main room, and you can chat with me and whoever else is going to be here in the main room. But otherwise, I'm going to push you over into the breakout rooms. You're going to spend around eight minutes there. I'll let you know when there's two minutes remaining. And I'd like you to have a conversation with each other about how can positive intent, facing down reality, finding meaning, and some ingenuity help when your resiliency is challenged. And I want this to be about you individually. And when we come back, we'll share real quick in the chat and then move into some change and how we do that with the team. So I'm opening this up. As said, if you have an issue, raise your hand. Or if people aren't in your room, just jump back in the main room and you'll chat with me. Over to you all. Hello? One second here and... Okay. And we are gonna have that chat right here, my friend. Hello. It looks like Zoom is having an issue oh. with the ability to build some breakout rooms today, so. Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 Yes. One second, folks. Hello. Hello. One second. Hello. 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 Mine. <laughs> Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> okay, so if you're listening to me, I'm going to let you know something just really quick here. For whatever reason, Zoom is having an issue on the breakout rooms. And so I put everyone on mute and, uh, and I retained control of that ability to come off of mute. So the one thing I'm going to do is we're going to try and get the breakout rooms restarted. For whatever reason, there's a little bit of an issue uh, with that. So we'll try and fix that. But in the meantime, hey, could you mind putting into chat what are some ways that you could use this or some thoughts as we've gone through the individual perspective? Do you mind just putting in a chat? What does that look like? And I'll read some of these off as they come into chat in a second.
Okay, and I appreciate us putting this in the chat. Um, find myself partying with others that have similar interests and goals. That's a great one, thank you. Explore the perspectives. Focus on the solution, not the problems. That's a great one. And I mentioned this part about um, the ability to focus on what I influence. I may not be able to control, like as an example, what the uh, vaccine requirements might be or when they're going to be in our business. But what I can do is I can influence how we're talking about it, what the expectations are, and how we're gonna change based on that, as an example. Ask yourself, will this matter a year from now? I like to think about it in scheduling, like what's future Matt gonna think about when present Matt schedules you for another 12 hour day? It's a great one. Yep, and we're gonna try and open those rooms one more time. Go ahead. And we'll see if we jump into those. Yeah, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Appreciate you bringing that up, Tim. This is from uh, Carol Dweck, some really good stuff. She's got, it's a great book and it's a lot of good questions on how do I literally have a growth mindset? It's not about um, winning or losing. It's more about what have I learned? It's a great quote by Nelson Mandela that says, I never lose. I either win or I learn. I think that's the essence of a little bit of Carol Dweck and her work on growth mindset. All right, appreciate it. I'm not sure exactly why we can't do the breakouts. We're gonna keep moving here, apologize for that. Um, increase in resilience, and we'll unmute you in a little bit here at the end, but I'm just gonna chat and put some stuff into, into uh, in the chat room, we'd appreciate that. And we will be working with a little Mentimeter here. One way that kind of fights against our resilience is a lot of change. Processing through it, leading through it is important. I love the picture here about the changing weather system. Um, we'll throw around terms like, oh, I really don't like change or people don't find change easy. Let's find that out. I'd like you to reflect on two changes you've experienced in your own past. Um, it can be personal or professional. And I want you to think about it in two different categories. A change that you chose, you made the choice for it, and then a change that was inflicted on you. All right, so as an example, um, a change that I chose was uh, to go through a divorce. And that's a really tough one, but it was one that I chose. Um, a change that was inflicted on me was multiple times I was giving assignments um, in the military, my past work, where I didn't have a choice about where I was going and what I was doing. Whether I agreed with the policy or not, that was my job to go. So this would be two changes um, that happened here, All right? Personal professional, a change you chose and one that was inflicted on you. I don't care whether it's personal or professional, I just need you to have the one and two there. A change you chose and a change was inflicted on you. Let's think first about the change that you chose. The change you chose, here we go. I'm gonna bring us into Menti again. And here's what I want you to answer. For the change you chose, I wanna think you to think back, what was your first reaction? Was it, hell yes, I am ready to go? Was it maybe, I kinda of need some more information? Was it man the cannons, I am actively resistant, even though I chose it? Or is it, oh, expletive, crap, shit, whatever you want to call it. Yes, we cuss on this one. It's a PG-13 kind of webinar. Oh, crap, this is terrifying. So tell me for the change you chose, what was your first, first gut reaction? I know we have probably oh, 300 and something people on this, 360. I'm looking for that number in the bottom right-hand corner to get us a little bit larger here so we can actually show you how fascinating this is. This is change that you chose. You were making the change. You decided to make the change. What's your first reaction? Ready to go, need more information, resist, or this is terrifying. Okay, so as you can see, a lot of us more in the ready to go is the majority, followed by, hey, I need some more information. And perhaps even though I chose it, and this is terrifying, very little in the man the cannons. In other words, actively resist this. All right, I'm gonna move us into the next question. The next question is on the change that was inflicted on you. The change was inflicted on you. What was your first reaction? Same exact choices. Hell yes, ready to go. I need more information. Man the cannons, resist. This is terrifying. First gut reaction, give me that answer. Appreciate you all being in the mentee system. This is great information that I'm giving back to you all. Okay. As you might imagine, I'm gonna transition us back into some points about this, then I'll bring us into Menti and I'll show you the differences here as you finish up your votes. What we can conclude about some of this change, and I always like when people are like, well, people don't like change. Ladies and gentlemen, I drive an SUV. If you suddenly said to me, I know you didn't ask for this, but here's a new set of keys. It's a Ferrari. It's a U458 Italia, but now you're driving a Ferrari. I'm pretty much perfectly fine with that change. 
I'll find a way for my kids to Uber to their school. I'm driving a Ferrari. No problem with that change. Here's what we find about any type of change. In general, people have a more favorable reaction to the change they chose or they have a choice in. In general, people are more likely to resist change that is simply inflicted on them. And the less information that people have about a change decreases the resilience and change obviously can be very contextual to the individual. I mentioned, and we'll run this with large numbers or senior teams, what you'll find is someone will say, um, oh, the change I chose, we were gonna have kids, greatest day of my life. And someone will say, oh, we found out we were gonna have kids. That was terrifying. Divorce, I was so looking forward to it. Divorce, it was so terrible. Change is very contextual to the individual, but there are ways to increase resilience to change. I'm gonna show you this proof of this really quick. So I asked you, hey, for the change inflicted on you, what did you want? Your first reaction was, the most important thing you said was, I need more information. Followed by, this is terrifying, followed by man the cannons. And the last one was, hey, I'm ready to go. I'll watch what happens when I move it back one and say, hey, but what about for the change that you chose what happens? Look at the difference. Number one here is I'm ready to go, followed by I need more information. Very different. So what I'm saying is it's not that I'm trying to change how people process change on this. I'm literally trying to give you some tips on, well, then if that's the case, how do I increase the resilience? This is an entire class that we offer. I'm just going to go through this a little quickly here. On the left-hand side, change is announced. Doesn't matter what it is. On the right-hand side, I'm expecting out of my team members some type of action. Under there are the main areas. There's a response, it's letting go, there's looking forward and learning. As you see under each one of those, so this area here, excitement and fear or relief and disappointment, these are the two areas that I might be more leaning in or leaning away from them, all right? And that can happen either way. As humans, we all go through this. It doesn't matter. Some of us would say, oh no, no, I, I process change very quickly or I love change. Maybe, perhaps, it probably depends on what it is. And maybe you are a person that really enjoys a lot of the, 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 um, the variability, right? The variability, the it's new, it's different, we're building something. And other people like the, actually, I want to be predictable. I want it to stay here. Either way is perfectly fine. As a human, we all go through this. What we call this is in the box. Uh, having a lexicon, having language for all of us to use with one another is important. Hey, how are you doing? I don't know, on this latest initiative, I'm a little in the box right now. It lets us know we're processing things. The mistake that a lot of leaders make is they've already gone through all of this by the time they're communicating it to the organization. And what they expect is for the organization to go directly from announcement of change right into action. And that is exactly how to sabotage resilience during change. That's when I get people who want to, I'm bringing this back into your information you gave me. That's when I get into more man the cannons, this is terrifying and I need more information because I haven't done any of the work in here to allow people to go through these steps. All right, so how do I increase resilience to the change? I gather input. I give opportunities for ownership. I want you to lead even the smallest amount of ownership here. I want you to lead this meeting. Um, I want you to be the note taker. I want you to run this part of the project. I want you to go research something for us. Um, I'm defaulting to asking open-ended questions. Those are questions that cannot end in a yes or no. The end with much more of a, how do you think about this? As an example, I could ask you, did you like the session on resilience? That's yes or no. The session on resilience was great, right? Now I'm leading the witness versus, hey, that session on resilience, what do you think? Completely open-ended. Can I acknowledge that sometimes people are in the box and you may say, hey, Matt, I don't have time for that. Well, you don't have time for this either. This is what's occurring. So either you acknowledge that and allow this to happen or you're just fighting against this, but either way, it's taking time. You're not saving any by not allowing to acknowledge that. Be open to iteration, tweaks, some evolution, provide options within it, and then design communication be two-way, two transmit and listen. It's why I wanted to put you in breakout rooms earlier, because I want you to have the chance to talk to one another. That's the best design of this. And I know we have some tech issues, we're moving through it. Open-ended versus closed questions. I wanted to share this with you. I know this is a, it's a complete eye chart on this one. And I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but basically I would ask some basic questions. On the left-hand side is the good side. So what you see here are a lot of your open-ended questions. What concerns do you have? How could you make this better? I'm not gonna read all of these, but at the bottom here, what you'll see is it cultivates curiosity. I encourage listening, I advance the idea. There's some shared ownership. It conveys I'm literally supporting you. 
on the right hand side are closed questions. And I'm going to articulate this by asking them really fast. And I want you to just think about how this makes you feel. Hey, so uh, do you agree with the change? Do you consider the impact on revenue? You can administer this, right? How are you going to execute this? Hey, your team, they're going to support this change, right? That's your job, you know? And your leader, you've informed him or her about it. That's great. I need you to run a particular report on this, right? And the TPS cover sheets, I need those on there. That's how it comes across. It's cross-examination. These are yes or no answers. It advances my agenda, no one else's. The ownership stays with me because now I'm in power. It also displays control. This is why I get resistance. This fights against resiliency and opening to questions encourages that. Yes, TPS cover sheets. I'm glad at least one of you got that reference from Office Space. So a couple of reflection questions. How can you lead your people through the box more effectively? And I'm, I'm giving this to you. This is our favorite question to ask as consultants. If I'm asked to go in and learn a new organization, learn a specific area of the organization, learn about one job, the question I'd love asking people is this, what do people not know about your job, but you wish they did? And I don't care if it's a CEO all the way to a frontline worker that's cleaning the floors, whatever it might be, what do people not know about your job, but you wish they did? The answer will come and it will come in forms of two areas they want you to know about. The first is they want you to know how hard they are working, the effort that goes in to their job. The other part that will fall into it will be they want you to know how important it is. They've done the intellectual activity to know this is how hard I work and this is the impact it has in the organization. My friends, I'm telling you this question is pure gold. You will learn so much about a person, about the organization, about how they feel about asking that one single question. And the best part about this is the person feels valued because it defaults to putting you in listening mode. I'm not a great listener by like by genetic design. I'm just not. What this does, it allows me to force myself to be in more receive mode. It's an open-ended question and it allows the other person to talk. And because I really enjoy people and I enjoy learning, um, I am easily, easily sedated almost into being a much better listener because I've asked this question. And then I sit back and let them talk to me. Great question, pure goal, please use it. It's really great. It's a little bit on how we process through change. All right, so a little bit more about as a team. And actually, before I get into that part of it, can I just, since we have an issue with the Mentimeter, and I know I'm going to run a little bit early because of that, can we just pause here real fast? And I'm going to go back one and just make sure that we're all okay with how I'm taking us, where we're going. And I'll ask the host, uh, if they'd like to unmute people, just let us know you want to unmute by raising your hand. But maybe something in the chat. How is this going so far? Are we okay? And maybe more specifically, as we talked about this area about moving through change, um, anything we want to pull out or take from that? What do we think about that? Especially to bring us back to uh, this slide here. Any other commentary? So we're spot on, we're excellent. If it's not good, let me know if you want me to pivot on this, but I just want to take a quick pause here and take any questions that we might have. I know there's a whole bunch of literature and work around change management. Um, I'll mention to you though, as soon as, okay, I'll get to the generational part. As soon as I ask people to give me word association with change management, it's so rare that I get any positive word out of change management. I get necessary control, corporate, all those kind of things. So much of change management is asking better questions, giving some ownership, understanding where people are coming from. They'll lean in, but they got to know that you care and they got to know that you recognize how hard it is that they're working and the impact that they're having. That's the ones. Um, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up. There was a question about generation. Um, I'm not a generational expert. And I will tell you that the commentary I'm going to give you really quickly on this is going to be perhaps in a lot of way in opposition even to other things you're hearing. I don't say this as authority or as a subject matter expert. I offer it to you in respect, transparency, and so that you could take this and think that's interesting. Um, at one point for my military background, I ran boot camp for the military. Um, all of these people, this was during a time of war and every single person in my thousands of people organization, they were all millennials and they were all volunteers. I've never seen a group more um, physically and mentally fit. I've never seen a group that was faster to learn and more informed. Um, what I have found is not that there is generational differences. What I find is 
the mistakes that we were making in person are exacerbated now on uh, virtual. And so I don't see a generational difference. I do see that the current generation expects more information, but that's because they live in an information world. Um, I do see that they want a more sense of purpose, but that's because they're more informed and they see other opportunities where um, just having a job, those were table stakes earlier. And now it's, yeah, it's not just having a job. I got plenty of opportunities. Um, and so I'm a little bit different and that I don't lean in. And as a leadership institute, we don't lean into generations and we lean in more to what do I know about humanity and humans? And I just want to mention this really quickly. If I run this activity for the change inflicted on you and for the change you chose, I see no difference in any of the generations. We'll ask questions like, what do great leaders do? And then we'll build a word cloud right here in Mentimeter. I see no difference in generations. And we've tried it before. It's really interesting. I mean, so the generation piece, um, yeah, I just don't see it as much. So appreciate that. Jamie or Sarah, were I missing any questions about this before we move into the next area of content? There's a couple questions around the box. One, so I'll summarize them sort of quickly. How much time should we allow somebody to be in the uh, box? And then how do leaders know where somebody in their span of care might be in the box? Yep, great question. So thank you. I'm going to highlight this in the box again. One, the time. I know this is a really lousy uh, answer, but it depends. But I don't want to just leave it there and say, ah, you know, it depends. Good luck to you. I would say to this, it definitely depends on the individual. However, you will increase the time that someone is in the box, the less amount of transparency and communication and listening that you do. We'll work with organizations and they'll say, why did we score so low on some of our assessments? They'll say, why did we score so low on communication? We are talking constantly. And we'll just kind of wait until they're like, yeah, we don't actually uh, uh, have the opportunity for listening. Because all of us, myself included, gosh, we had a lot of training on transmit. Like, I'm going to grab that walkie-talkie, I'm going to hit that button, and I am going to talk at you. I'm going to tell you why it's so important that we're making this change. But I haven't gone back and said, here's where we are. Here are the perspectives we've considered. Here's what the current environment, what we know. Here's how I personally feel about it. Here's what the feelings I think you're feeling about it. But right now, I need to hear you. Um, and so part of this is, I know that I'll extend the time someone's in the box by simply transmitting at them. One of the ways to understand and to see how long it takes is literally asking people, giving them this slide and being like, hey, on our whole thing where we're pivoting, where are we right now, do you think, overall? People love giving the feedback about themselves, about a self-assessment. They'll be like, oh, I think part of us is letting go. I think part of us is looking forward. Tell me more about that. Well, I think IT has let go. They had to a long time ago. And actually, we're constantly throwing the IT department into a bunch of change. So they're probably looking forward already. Letting go has to be our marketing team. They're a little bit like, well, this is a whole different way to get in front of clients. Of course, I'm making this up. But one way to find out where are we in the box is asking. People love it. At the end of meeting, ask, how did this meeting go? What could have made it better? Hey, how are we doing? Are we in the box with this or are we okay with the change? That kind of transparency people appreciate so much. And I know we're in this virtual world. All the virtual world did was, hot, my opinion, all it's done is highlight what we weren't doing well in person. So there you go. Any other things we have to do with this, uh, Jamie, that I'm missing from a question before I get into this? No, I think you're good. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Uh, one of the one I want to take from uh, Chaz, I appreciate you bringing this up. What do you recommend we transmit to leaders who are not taking their time to lead the box, expect the big jump? Um, one is for a lot of leaders, they honestly, you know, we promoted the best doers. And so they're used to getting stuff done. Um, intellectually, I would lead them through this to say, you've already processed all of this. And I'd run them through, I'd easily, if you wanted to give them proof, I'd run like a mentee poll system of some of your people. Like I'm basically trying to give some leaders, I'm just gonna show you what the data is about how you're leading um, and how people are leaning into this on that. A lot of times when we work with leaders, it's not a hard thing to convince them, but in all fairness to some leaders, they've never been taught this. I haven't been given any of this framing and I haven't been actually trained to lead people. I was just really good at getting done the work. So they made me queen and king of the doers. And I haven't actually been told, fundamentally my job has literally changed. So. I'm going to transition into uh, as a team. I got a couple of videos to show you here and some questions as well on this one. So let's start off with um, some basic concepts about resiliency. I know that a lot of us put in about how it's toughness. 
And I think oftentimes we literally think about this as a sol solitary endeavor. It is about you toughening up. This is a picture of a place that I served for a couple of years. This is in West Africa. It's just outside the city of Monrovia in Liberia. And I always love this picture because I remember watching uh, people, they would carry a lot of the objects directly on their head. Uh, this is probably a bag of cassava leaves and the cassava tree or something like that. But it was really interesting, like in, in the West, or at least where I am, we have a backpack or in the military, we have this huge backpack. But at the end of the day, I should be so sore because all the weight pulling back on me or when you're carrying things in front of you and all the weight that's pulling you forward. And so it's really interesting how they are so adept, the people who live there, at carrying things directly, directly above them. And I think about this for a metaphor for resiliency. We just expect to load these things on top of people's head and more and more and more, and we expect them to just walk through it. And this is actually what resiliency is not. It is completely very different. And you might say, well, hold on. Since somebody put in a Finding Nemo, Just Keep Swimming Dora comment, this is Diana Nygarden. So if you, until you don't know her, she at the age of, I think, Nyad, thank you. I think she at the age of 64 swam 53 miles in open water from Cuba to Florida, shark infested, jellyfish infested waters all by herself. And you think that person, she is incredible. She is so resilient. She did it on her own. No, she did not, my friends. She had kayakers to support food, water, energy gels, chase away the shark. She's the only one who's done this without a shark cage. Just a support vessel there called Voyager. And you see all the people that were there. And if you think this is just my interpretation of this, I'm gonna show you a video. This is Diana when she first came upon the beach in Matt, you're muted. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So I'm going to show you a video of when Diana lands on the beach in Florida. Now she's been in the water for 53 hours. So she looks pretty rough as any of us would. You'll see some swelling because she's had to wear a mask, keep away from the jellyfish and her support team is there. And this is the speech that she gives. Resiliency is a team sport. Um, there are people in your organization that say, look, we're trying to go over this wall. The first thing I need to do is I need to put somebody on the wall. And then with those people on the wall, the next thing they need to do is they need to get people over that wall. I know I'm showing you some military training here, but it's a great metaphor for your organization. That wall is, um, that wall is work from home policies. That wall is, I now have to homeschool kids. That wall is, uh, will I have a job? That wall is, I need to reinvent myself. That wall is, we have to reinvent our business. That wall is, we've had to go through some layoffs, some retrenchment. That wall is the current environment. And no one's expected as an individual to climb a 16 foot wall. But what we do expect is that our organization, that our people that we work with, that we trust, that we build relationships with, that they're gonna pick us up. And we're gonna ask for help and they're gonna be there. And you watch this last person as he runs back, you'll notice this, the two people run and run and immediately their hands are back down because what they're expecting is, yep, I'm gonna bring the last one along. Now you look at this and like, oh, thanks to the military analogy, but we're not a bunch of whatever, like these characters are. It doesn't matter. Resiliency is a team sport in any organization. These are pictures from our parent company in Barry Waymiller. It's the ability, I know it looks like I'm reaching down off the wall, but the wall is your current kind of conditions, your environment, and reaching down looks like this. Can I seek to understand what your conditions are? The way I do that and the most helpful way I can do that is by listening to you, especially on the front end. As a leader, the decision that I make, the decisions I will make, will get so much better when I listen on the front end. And I know I see in the chat, like, you got to know your team's strengths. Yes, and the way to do that is a lot of times it's literally to listen. The reason this becomes so powerful, especially for resilience, is it conveys a sense of empathy. In other words, I understand and I can share the feelings that you're feeling. I see it as you see it. I feel it as you feel it. I think it as you think it. But the way to get there is by listening to another human being. And it relates right back into resiliency. There's no one better that we have found that can articulate empathy, especially its difference from sympathy better than Brene Brown. So I'm going to share this video with you right now with her. A little bit about empathy, um, but from a standpoint of resilience or not resilience, my left-hand side, these are some examples of empathetic responses. Basically, I'm understanding or I'm trying to, I'm recognizing, I'm accepting. 
I may not agree with that. I don't even have to get into that back and forth. I just can say, I appreciate your perspective. I see where you're coming from. Um, this happens in really good relationships. This is why we want people to work together before they're just going into um, some type of project. This is why we do personal connections. The non-empathetic responses on the right-hand side here, and I know a lot of this work is, as a leader, can I be more self-aware? What are the ones I'd ask you just kind of in the back of your mind? What's the one that you may not do, but you certainly think it at times? Like for me, uh, my favorite, my go-to is you're going to be fine. Stop worrying. It's all going to be fine. That really needs to change, especially with COVID. There's so much we don't know about it. Um, and the jobs, the people's family, like you think about the issues and the stress people are under, why it's so important on the left-hand side there to stay more in the empathetic responses. I may still think it at times like, these are champagne problems, my friends, we're all going to be just fine, rub some dirt in it, toughen up. But what I have to show up is much more in the listening and accepting. I get where you're coming from. Might not be a big deal to me. It's clearly a big deal to you. And I'm not going to say that. I'm going to try and show up that I understand it's a big deal to you. That's what starts to build a little bit more resilience because people expect you to show up that way. The other thing that's really critical, and I won't belabor this one a lot, uh, but I'll just work this out here. The other one is to create some type of structure. So whether in, a, in a, your own organization, I would do the same thing from a military if we're on a deployment and deployments would be like the times where all of a sudden a lot of people are in a new environment having to do work, a la COVID, work from home, all the rest of the stuff, whether you're a critical business and part of you are in the office, part of you are in on the factory floor or doing the service and part of you are home. I'm gonna break work into milestones. I'm gonna identify in scope and I put this in red because I see this happen so much. I'm gonna put what is out of scope. One thing that fights against resilience is, I'm just remember that the picture of the woman that's walking in Monrovia in Liberia with the bag on her head. The reason I wanna list what's out of scope is for our projects, we just start throwing more stuff in that bag, more and more. And I'm not even using the like project management official term of scope creep. I'm just telling you, we didn't name what's out of scope. Um, an example, in scope for this project is, we are to identify a viable CRM content resource manager program, some type of technology. I need to list that out of scope is the training of team members on said technology. I need to break this out and just say, here's what the project is. Um, oftentimes, especially when we're starting to go in a lot of different directions, at the least amount of my letting my team members know, here's what priority one is and here's what priority six is. So that when they have to make decisions in day to day, I've helped them understand and organize their day. This way it becomes so much easier to say, of course I didn't work on that. I had all priority one stuff today. I'm gonna to celebrate the smallest of accomplishments and I'm gonna establish a communication structure. This last bullet sounds so simplistic. It's a way that I can literally build in, this is not the right terminology, I just haven't found a better way to say this. It's a way that I can build in false structure. The fact that uh, during this, like for example, for us, when we went to COVID, every morning for half an hour, we had a team meeting. Our group in South Africa is communicating with our group in London and California, here in St. Louis, and we're all meeting for half an hour to start the day off, update of communications every single morning. That has since decreased to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Every Friday afternoon, every other week, we're doing a happy half hour. You don't have, it's not like you have to be drinking some kind of alcoholic drink. I just need you there communicating in a personal get together. No work is, no work is discussed. But I'm building in common communication touch points to decrease the anxiety, the uncertainness, even if all I have to say is I have no more new information, people appreciate the fact that you've built a structure into this and I'm communicating regularly. Um, yeah, almost like a self-organizing team, sure. But even more so, I would even mention, um, think about the last time when you were flying, think about the last time you're flying, the aircraft is stuck on the tarmac and you have no idea when you're gonna leave. The pilot gets on and she might say, hey, listen folks, we're stranded here, uh, weather's coming through, I've got a maintenance check out of something, I'll let you know when we're about ready to go, I'll give you an update whenever I can. And now you're waiting two hours or an hour and you have no idea what's happening. Versus the same pilot and she gets on and she goes, hey everyone, here's what I'm faced with. I'm gonna give you regular updates on the 15 minute mark, regardless of what information I have, just to let you know I'm still tracking this. And then every 15 minutes, she's coming on and saying, here's what I now know. And it might be, I don't have any new information, but I've seen this happen we work, we do some work with airlines. I've seen this happen and people so appreciate the routine, the structure and the commonality of the communication coming through. All right. 
The other way to help with your team resilience is uh, schedule time to recharge. Um, one, if you can, can I schedule some time for 25 or 55 minutes versus the full hour? I was talking to a client recently and she has a Cortana. I think it's like the, the PC system of Siri. And she was working so much and stacking so many meetings. Cortana came on and said, you're working, you've stacked your meetings too much. I need to schedule you time to recharge and literally booked her thinking time, connection time and solo time or something like that. Like basically I need you to meditate. We've even built this into, I wouldn't call it artificial intelligence, more like machine learning to say in our schedules now, I'm going to schedule you for some downtime to just literally think instead of running from meeting to meeting. Um, we would highly encourage people to share updates in their personal life. Um, if I'm looking for one question that can tell me a lot about the culture of an organization, I will ask people, do you think, do you feel that your direct leader cares about you as a person? Before job function, before anything else you're supposed to report on, do you think your leader cares about you as a person? If the answer is yes or I strongly agree in that, I know a lot of positive things are happening in that organization already. But you have to share some updates on personal life, and we'll do that a lot. We mentioned this part. We usually conclude the week with a short 30-minute team connection, and we definitely ramp up the recognition. Huge amount of this says, can I value you and do I see you? Do I see the work you're doing and the value it is? Because people want to know that who they are and what they do matters. And recognition, when done correctly, genuine, proportional, timely. I don't need money. I don't need some kind of software program. I don't need gift cards. I just need to tell another human being how I feel and I see them and I see how hard they're working. I'm going to give you a quick construct for this. Instead of just saying things like, hey, great job, good job, good job, pointing fingers, walking through really quickly, everybody, great job. It doesn't land. And I think you can know that even from your own experience. It needs three primary areas here, feelings, behavior, and impact in any order. I can have these in any order, but I need to literally let another human being, this is how I feel about what you've done. This is the behavior that you've exhibited, not a concept, not an idea. What did you actually do? It's the behavior and really importantly, what's the impact? So you can see example here, Jennifer, I'm grateful and inspired. Those are the feelings by your willingness to ask questions, share your thoughts on how to improve client communications. That's the behavior. Literally what was done. Other people are hearing this, right? So now I can see this. Your curiosity and informed contributions make us a more collaborative team that serves our clients in even better ways. That is how we do a recognition message. And we do this constantly, specific. Yeah, very specific. I'd also offer that if you have the time, and this is the reason why for this, it's much more powerful if you're writing it handwritten. And I get it. And you can, maybe right now you're like, I don't have time to get up. Or send a handwritten note. My gosh, the holidays are coming. I've got enough busyness going on. There are plenty of apps such as TouchNote, my postcard, Postagram. And if that's not enough, like I've literally written notes on napkins, taken a picture of them at a bar when I'm traveling or something, and then text them to another person. And it comes across as different because you spent the one commodity that we all have that's valuable that we can't get more of, and that is time. That's what a handwritten note does for someone. And so I would just mention the more you can do this, the better. Um, the other part of this that's really powerful, and this is something that we use, and we used this when I was in the military, ran this, and we ran this now. Basically, periodic communication. So every week, every week on Friday, especially because of how many things we're asking people to do right now. I'm asking you to innovate. I'm asking you to go through change. You don't need to read this, this slide. It's just basically that we try to take and say, here are all the things that went right this week around the entire organization. And then we send it out to everyone. And that's it. Everyone, the last message they get official from the rest of the week is, I want you to know here's all of the great things that we did. Yes, we still have the conversations on what went wrong, quote unquote, what we learned, how we can get better. Yes, we have all of those things. When I'm asking people to work through such uncertainty, such newness, a lot of change and take chances and risks, I need them to know we're still killing it, really doing a great job in other areas especially when you have an organization where some people are very much aligned into delivering the product, building it, servicing clients, working with the customer. They're getting the interaction. They're getting the thanks literally from there. Think about an airline, the mechanic, you're never thinking the mechanic. You're thinking perhaps the pilots, if you see them as you're leaving or entering, but you really only have an opportunity to thank the flight attendants. 
okay, well, how do the mechanics and the gate agent and everyone else that helped put that aircraft in the sky, how are they being recognized? This is one of those ways. The Leadership Institute is no different. There are some of us, there are some of us that are building everything to make this stuff work. Everyone gets to be represented when we do a communication. We simply call it in a week and we start it out with, hey, in a week, this is what we did great. And it's the thing that people go into the weekend thinking about. Cool, right? Could be just me. I like this. All right. All right. I'm not going to do this breakout session uh, for us. I am going to give you some action items. So we're going to open this up with about 15 minutes remaining for questions. Um, one is some action items. Again, I'm going to send the slides out. I would review all those reflection questions. They're great to have a discussion with your team. You're going to get some great ideas. You also will, especially if you fall back into listening, you'll start to see where some things are frustrating in the business, where people need some work and some help to have the systems fixed. Individually, I'd like you to consider some positive intent where you could use that. Focus on what you can control and influence. Stay busy with that purpose. During change, and we talked about that a lot, and then of course, as a team, I'm listening with empathy. I'm using those open-ended questions. I'm inserting recharging opportunities. And man, do I crank up on that recognition and celebration. Um, if you're taking only one thing from this, I would say, especially from a resiliency standpoint and the team aspect, crank up the recognition and celebration. Let people know that who they are, what they do matters, that they're not Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill. You see them, you see how important it is, the work that they're doing. 